Tom, why don't you pray for us? Would you do that? Heavenly Father, we just are so grateful for this time together. And uh, we're so grateful for your word that's coming to us this weekend. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, as we all fall to enabling uh, the sin around us, that, uh, that the words we hear will help us as we, uh, as we just learn your word and how to apply it to our lives. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Here comes tech. You can't turn that on, can you? That TV? Can you jump? Well, I didn't know if that was connected to that, but I think I can see it. Okay. Woo! Wow. Binoculars. Well, <laughs> this is probably not going to match. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna try, but you just go ahead. Do your best. We're just gonna roll with it. Yeah, that is way far over there. I got the glasses on to the contacts, and it may not even be connected. But like that is nice when you're, and then so you could maybe move back and go to your seat. That's warm. You know? Yeah, you can't help it. Nothing? You're on your own. What's that? You're on your own. Oh, I'm on my own. Okay. That was, that was his joke. <laughs> well, the, uh, I mean, the PowerPoint, well, here we go. Got it right here. Because of my awesome wife, she's got it ready for me. All right, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we won't uh, spend tons of time on this, but Counseling and Addicts Enabler is the name of this one. And I teach this one like in an hour and a half. So we're gonna zip, and I'm slow, so we're not gonna zip that much, but we're gonna cut as we go. But I, I and I said this today, that Really, many of you are going to have opportunities to counsel the family members more than you ever would the addicted person. So, are they recording that? Yeah. Oh, they are? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, you, you want to always look for enabling. And we'll talk about what enabling means in a minute. Um, sometimes you have to disguise it when you're counseling, so you don't always just... You know, you kind of counseling sometimes takes a little bit of art or skill and be careful how you say things. And, you know, it's just sometimes a game. You know that, Oliver, don't you? <laughs> Oliver is here with me. He uh, ran the Mission House out in Washington State. And so uh, there's some really good programs on our network, the Addiction Connection. Dot org. You go to our website and there's a map of programs like the one Oliver was the director of. And so if you need help with addiction counseling, uh, go to our website and find programs there. And um, They're biblical ones, not state-run ones. And we're hoping to populate it with more and more biblical programs around the country in the days ahead. But if you need help, Go to that website and then there are counselors on there too and there's non-residential programs programs that are doing good work that are outreach and um yeah so anyway okay so now couples too when you're counseling usually a married couple with a kid who's on drugs the couples will be split usually one's a hardcore enabler as we'll define it here in a minute and one of them is more on the truth, tough love side or whatever. So you kind of see that uh, as well. And in our objectives, we are going to talk about what is enabling and what are the, some of the heart issues behind it. Learn practical counseling tools and questions to ask enablers and examine the ways that enablers contribute to an addict's sin and scriptural examples and truths to help you confront and correct enabling a family member. So that's our, that's what we're gonna to try to tackle in the time here. Now Ephesians 5, 
11 to 17, I think is a good passage to think about when we're counseling family members. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So let's look first at what is enabling. There we go. Our first, boy, these are such beautiful slides. Is Beth in here? Beth Hancock? Boy, she did these. She is really good. And did them like lightning fast. So please tell her muchas gracias from me. That's Spanish. I took three years of Spanish and I'm fluent in Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love that joke. Yeah, it's terrific. I love that joke. You can use that, Jeff. Thank you. It's, it's yours. I'll credit you. Yeah. All right, so let's contrast the therapeutic secular definition of an enabler. All right, now the first thing, there are some positive connotations. This really isn't a biblical term. That we're talking about so we'll try to define it biblically in a minute but the positive connotation is that it means to empower to make able to to help someone so she gave me a loan to enable me to start my own business that's the idea here of positive enablement so there's nothing wrong with the word it's interesting oliver and i've been talking we were driving we drove up yesterday we're driving home tonight um, seven hours, so we're, we're going to see if we make it or not. But we were talking about if you hear that we're in a ditch, you know, you'll feel bad about laughing. Yeah, you'll feel bad about laughing, and it's on camera, so you know. Um, <laughs> no, it, it will be kind of funny, but we, we should make it. I think we'll make it. You're young. You're young. You'll be fine. Um, I'll be asleep. You'll be. But we, um, we're talking about words, and it's interesting. Gender transitioning surgery is what they used to call it. You're transitioning. Now they call it, when you have that, gender confirmation surgery. You're confirming the gender that you think you already are. You're confirming that. So they, they, they're, care, they're crazy with words and language. And, and this is a good word that's kind of been hijacked. I, I like the word enable, but uh, it has been hijacked. And in, in the addiction, this is tricky, in the addiction counseling world, secular addiction, enabling really has more of a negative connotation. You see some verses here about enable it, enablement in a positive way. James 2, 15 to 17. Uh, I, I love that idea of helping people who are lacking clothing or food and uh, you help them and then being generous to the poor, you're lending to the Lord and he will repay. And then 1 John 3, 16, 18. So all those are positive passages about enablement. But the negative part, the hijacking part is this, that there's a connotation in the addiction world that it really means to prohibit or shield someone from experiencing the full impact of the consequences of their behavior. So in other words, a person is failing to grow and change, which leads to more irresponsibility, possibly a victim mentality. And uh, there was a show, Intervention. Have you guys ever seen that show on A&E Network, The Intervention Show? It's, it's, last I checked, it had 20 seasons, not 20 episodes, 20 seasons of like 10 or 15 episodes per. So we're talking 200 episodes. And some of the episodes actually feature two families. <clears throat> so what they do is they follow them around with a camera, the addict, the addict's family, and they try to catch the dynamics and then they do an intervention to try to get the addicted person into a secular rehab. It's a secular show. 
And it's interesting, on one of them that I watched, I mean, they're all basically the same, so you only need to see it once or twice, but they show a mother with her son, and he's saying, yeah, mom, you know, I need, I need money for groceries. And she's like, okay, how much you need? Uh, you know, 50 bucks. And, okay, all right. And she gives him like, all I got is two 20s. He gives him 40 bucks. And he takes the money and he goes. And then the camera stay on her. And they say, you know, do you think he's going to spend that on, on groceries? And she says, no, I don't think he will. What do you think he'll spend it on? She says, well, I think drugs. So why'd you give him the money? Well, if I don't, I won't have a relationship with him. He, he won't talk to me unless I, you know, she didn't use the word enable, but unless I give it to him, he, he's not going to talk to me. So that's the, the idea here is the family continues to really fund the drug activity. That, that's what's going on. And uh, the enabler loves that. Right? I mean, the, uh, fam the drug addict loves that they have enablers. We'll talk about that in a second. So because of these connotations, a biblical counselor uh, has to discern the heart motives, help the counselees to do that, to discern their heart motives for their actions, leading them to repentance. That's what we're trying to do, to get them to repent. Uh, and obviously we don't force people to repent. The Holy Spirit does that, but we... You know, if we don't call people to repent, they won't repent, you know, and you got to help family members. So I'm oftentimes leading family members to repent and to change. And the worst enabler I ever had was a man. His wife was not the enabler. She was actually really tough on their son. And this guy was not tough. He was the one that just gave him everything. And I gave him my book, Divine Intervention. And you can come on in right here. Yeah, come on. Um, maybe don't sit. Uh, yeah, okay, all right, good. Yeah, I'm looking at that, trying to watch that uh, screen. Um, so we gave him the book, Divine Intervention, and I remember he kept it by his bedside table. I was like, oh, that's so good. And it really changed how he treated his son. Well, the neat thing in this story was, a few months later, the son came in for counseling. Can't make this up. And he comes in and he goes, what'd you do to my dad? Like, he doesn't give me anything. He doesn't help me anymore, you know? And I used to, you know, milk him like a cow kind of thing. And, uh, and it was neat. And so this guy said, yeah, I've been clean a little while because, you know, my dad quit enabling me was the idea. So that was a cool, you know, that was a cool story. He, I, I like those. Um, a neat, neat, neat thing. So we got to help people to understand what they're doing is not helping because that's what they're thinking. I'm helping my loved one. I'm giving them 40 bucks for groceries, even though she knew on camera that that's not what she was doing, that mother in that example. Uh, we have to help them. So are they in, let's see. Yeah, are they encouraging responsibility? Are they protecting from consequences? Bailing him out of jail uh, really fast is, is the example I use. I mean, I had one, one family, they called me, little Johnny's in jail, uh, what do we do? So I'm glad you asked, leave him in there. Leave him in there a few days, let him experience the weight of it, right? And next day called me, we got him out. <laughs> we got him out. We couldn't, yeah, didn't even let him stay a few hours. And, uh, and, and, and that was the family dynamic. I mean, rescue him. They didn't want to be embarrassed that their son was in jail. I mean, it was that kind of thing. And the uh, neat thing is my, um, my mentor just sent me, he said, I thought you'd be interested in this. So, I, so he sent me this paper this kid wrote. And I'm reading it, and I'm like, man, I got a lot to do. I don't care to read some kid's paper, you know, in his class. And, but he's my mentor and, you know, I love him. I know he always means good for me, so I'm reading it. At the very end, I see the name and it's this kid who, you know, went to jail and mom and dad bailed him out. So I guess he's doing well. He's studying biblical counseling, praise the Lord, you know. That was a really neat thing that just happened just a few months ago. Um, so 
they bail them out, get them out of their consequences really quickly, and the parents uh, do that kind of thing quite often. So, you know, they're, they're kind of working against you in that, but you just have to do what you've got to do. And, and I understand it. It's hard for your kid to be in jail. Um, that's a hard thing, you know. Uh, and that's what we're kind of asking parents to do is do the hard thing, set the limits, follow through with, you know, those, those uh, consequences and don't just enable them or bail them out. And so what we want to do is figure out um, what, why they're enabling. So is the enabler feeling guilty for some reason? <clears throat> Is that what's going on? Is the enabler feeling fearful or anxious? Like, if I don't do something, he's going to die. You know, that is feeling guilty about poor parenting, feeling fearful, anxious. Is the enabler ignorant about what truly is, what help truly is? Are they going to teach biblical truth? Or we have to teach biblical truth, sorry. This is kind of difficult. I'm sitting there. I know you think I'm staring at you, but I'm not. I promise. <laughs> I'm just looking at that tiny little screen. Um, is that the one? Is the enabler ignorant about what help truly is? Is that on there? Okay, good. So we have to teach them biblical truth and understanding, you know, guilt and, and those kinds of things and their responsibility, their, the kid's responsibility. You know, I always think about... Uh, in Exodus, the commandment to honor your father and mother, that's a commandment to kids, right? To young people. So, I mean, we, we often take, don't let kids be responsible. We just think, oh, they can't do that, they can't do this. And kids can do a lot more than we uh, give them credit. And they understand a whole lot more than we think they do. Then this fourth question, is the enabler acting in the best interest of self? If they are, then it's idolatry for them. Can the enabler begin to do things for God's glory? So here's some heart questions that we want to ask. Um, and can the enabler see that he is leaning upon his own understanding? Again, another heart question where you're trying to help them to see why am I enabling? And a lot of moms will feel guilty. They'll beat themselves up. I was a poor parent. I've got to do this. You know, it could be a lot of different things. We're just trying to reveal it, bring it to light so that they can confess it, repent, and then rest. Trust in Christ and rest. And your child may not, may not repent. You know, may not change. There's a gentleman at the conference. He's going to get his son tonight and and he's calling his son to repent, you know, and going to go get him right now as we speak. So we prayed and, and are hoping that the son gets in the car with him. He, he may not. He may um, avoid his dad. So very sad, very real situations. I think a lot of parents feel some guilt and shame anyway. So they're afraid to tell other people, our sons, our daughters out. But it's so much more common than, you know, than people realize. They think it's their little dark secret and they were such terrible parents and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, bringing that out to light, I mean, that's one thing I appreciate about Pastor Brad Bigney at my church. He's our senior pastor. You may know him uh, or of him, but he's five kids. One of them just got saved about a year and a half ago. And uh, I think a couple others are still not yet saved, you know, and um, he's just open about that and talks about that so that it doesn't have to be this shameful thing that everyone in the church is, you know, ashamed of. So he talks about it very openly. And, uh, and I think that's encouraging to people that, you know, your lead guy doesn't have it all together, but is willing to talk about his faults and his uh, lacking in uh, parenting so all right our second point here is teach counsel is the principle of accountability to god each person is accountable for his or her own words and actions and there are a lot of verses here you see romans 14 12 so then each of us will give an account of himself to god matthew 25 
Hebrews 4.13. I love that one. No creatures hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. An account. And in Matthew 12, I don't even like to read verses 36, 37. I'd like to Thomas Jefferson these out of my Bible, right? I mean, Thomas Jefferson, you know, cut his Bible. Did you know that? Yeah, he took his Bible and cut things out he didn't like. Yeah, imagine that. I've thoughts crossed my mind a few times, you know? <laughs> and these would be two verses I would pick. I'll read them. Uh, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. Yeah, look that up. Thomas Jefferson Bible. He cut things out he didn't like. Don't get the Bible and subscribe to it. But uh, yeah, he did that. James 4, 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Amen. All right. And then no one's role is to be the Holy Spirit. Well, that's pretty clear, right? But people run around doing that kind of thing. Sorry, I got two sets of notes here, so I'm just cruising. So the goal is to help people to see that the idle, the unruly, the self-willed person, uh, all of those characteristics of this young person that they're, they're enabling, that uh, they're only enabling to continue being an idle unruly self-willed person and that they can't control them they can't be the holy spirit they can't fix it now god can use them as an instrument of righteousness right so he can use them in good ways but he's they're not going to be able to change the heart uh, you and i can't do that as well so <clears throat> we have to trust in god look at first timothy 5 13 through 15 there it is Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. And so we're gonna look at the busybody in just a moment. Uh, I, really, uh, I really think that's the closest biblical term to an enabler. Then you've got 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 12. Now we command you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother this is a Christian, any brother who's walking in idleness, not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Now let's look at one more. 1 Peter 4.15 See if I can pull it up here. Uh -uh. First Peter 4.15, it may not be on your screen. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. So now I know it's a stretch. But I don't know what that... It's a nice little umbrella, isn't it? Is that, is that, well? <clears throat> oh, there's First Peter. Yeah, there it is. Often fueled by pride. Okay, here we go. <sighs> Sorry, this is just tricky. 
The, uh, the busybody is often fueled by pride. A busybody uses his or her idle time to help someone. You know, it's kind of like that prayer request that people make, you know, where they're really gossiping. Hey, I need you to pray for Jeff. Uh, you know, and it ends up being gossip rather than really caring for them. That's, that's how I think about a busybody. Uh, thinking he or she knows better than they do, and maybe even better than God, is how they think. So busybodies meddle in someone's life, though it's disguised as compassionate concern. They think they can organize and help someone better than that person or than God can. So the characteristics of a busybody, I don't think these are in your notes. You might want to write these down. But it's one intent upon the matters of others. So they're interested in other people's lives. That, that's a busybody. And this is why I make the leap the, the, you know, to being an enabler, similar to that anyway. Uh, they're intent upon the matters of others. The second thing, they're fascinated, not disgusted. Fascinated, not disgusted by the sins of others. So that's why this is so strong. I mean, it's in the list of murderer, thief, evildoer, or as a meddler. It's like, wow, murderer, meddler? Is that equal? Could that even be? Well, yeah, because they're fascinated, not disgusted by the sins of other people. And then the third characteristic here is little focus on self. You know, it's not Matthew 7, where you take the the load-bearing beam, the log, out of your own eye. Think about the load-bearing beams, right, in, in most buildings or homes. Taking that, that, that's our sin. That's what we need to be concerned about, rather than the speck in our brother or sister's eye. So we've got to be concerned about the, the big sin, which is ours. So they have little, this is the third one, they have little focus on self, their identity in others and false security in that I am helping and nothing is wrong in my heart. <clears throat> All right. So enabling someone to continue in sin is sinful in of, of itself. You become an accomplice to the sin. You know, that's a powerful word. You're an accomplice. You're not robbing the bank, but you're driving a getaway car. You're helping. You're not, you're not uh, part of the solution here. You're really part of the problem. And enabling is a one-sided relationship that's doomed to fail. Nope, I may be clicking along too fast, am I? Oh, anyway. <clears throat> And an enabler could have their own need for counseling with this idolatrous heart desire. And I, I think they do. I think you have to meet with a family and kind of figure this out. And that's why I say you got to be kind of careful because you want to ask questions and figure it out without them knowing that you're doing that. You know, you want to be careful to identify it. And there, and I've noticed couples, they're really afraid to tell me who the enabler is sometimes sometimes they like he's the enabler you know <laughs> i mean sometimes you got that but sometimes they kind of go in like hey let's not let's not call each other out you know Let, let's help each other here and get through this um and, and then keeping the person from experiencing the consequences of their choices maybe keeping them from experiencing god's grace and sanctification in their lives i mean oliver and i were talking about the the circumstances, the consequences that come, like at the mission house, uh, when he would work with guys there, they need to experience the weight of their choices and not just be rescued out of that because that's actually God's grace. Did you know a speeding ticket is God's grace? Did you know that if Tom had gotten a speeding ticket today on the way to Niagara, it would have been God's grace in your life. Isn't that amazing? I'll let him explain it to you. He drove kind of fast. No, I'm kidding. Uh, he, he drove the speed limit, let the, let the camera. He was a good, good guy today. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't think about the negatives in life as God's grace. We only think God's grace is good 
Anything negative, that's Satan. Satan is doing that to me. But you know what? God is sovereign over all things. He's orchestrating our lives. And his grace in those bad things is meant to make us more like Jesus, to draw us closer to him, to trust him more. And so we, we tend to think if it's good, it's God's grace. If it's bad, it's Satan or my flesh or the world or, you know, politics or, you know, whatever. But it's something bad. But God is in control of our lives. And, and now this is Luke 15, 16, which is on your screen. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. That's God's grace in his life. If you're familiar with this parable, this is the place he gets to. He, he's wanting to eat pods that the human stomach cannot digest and no one gives him anything. So he's broke, the people around him are broke, there's a famine in the land and he's wanting to eat what pigs are eating and you know how Jesus is tell, telling the story to, to Jews, right? So they're... they're uh, opinion of pigs is not very high and so it's a very dramatic story but I have family members that the guy I'm telling you about that uh, read the book by his bedside table and then I was able to counsel his son later on I had him read that in my counseling session 10 times I said read that read this verse for me so he would read it I said, read the last part, and no one gave him anything. Read it again, and no one gave him anything. Read it again, no one gave him anything. Read it again, no one gave him I mean, tend to, I really did that to him. I mean, I did, you know, maybe I should repent. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but I did that to this poor guy. But I wanted to drive it home. You're giving him stuff. You know, now, now it's a parable, and I'm taking a little liberty there. I understand that. But I was driving the point home, and finally said, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. And, 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 of course, verse 17 is the great part of this. That's when he looks to heaven, he comes to himself. So this is the part right before that. Well, in counseling, this is where this guy was. He was before that moment of repentance. So, you know, so I think sometimes we have to try to drive it home with our counselees. All right. And then G, trusting God, even with their loved one's life, any counsel to an enabler must be gentle and truthful. I really emphasize gentle. Now, it didn't sound like I was very gentle a minute ago with that guy, but I really, I really tried to be very nice to him. Uh, must be gentle and truthful since the addict's deception and the self-deception of the enabler are huge issues. So you see it way before they see it. That's the point. So you still have to be gentle. You have to be kind. You see it. They don't see it yet. And we're praying, God, open their eyes. Help them to see. Help them to, to know this is true. But you see it because you're looking into their lives. And uh, what a privilege, right, to, to be able to do biblical counseling in this way. <clears throat> then deception, just staying on that for a moment, is most often motivated by fear. And this is free. I'm not going to charge any extra for this, Jeff. I promise. Um, when people lie, when they're deceptive, it's usually motivated by fear. And it's fear of man, fear of I don't want to get caught, fear of, you know, fear of man in the sense I don't want you to think badly of me. I think about Abraham, right? Didn't he lie twice? Once as Abram, once as Abraham about his wife, Sarah, which he said, tell me you're my sister, which was a half truth, right? But it wasn't the whole truth. And, and it got, hit, got her in, uh, in a really bad spot. And so deception is often motivated by fear and we have to uh, remember that. So there's the, the failure of Abram and Abraham Fear or love and trust in God. So what's motivating them? I want people to begin to be motivated by love. I remember I went into a program and was helping them to change the culture. And I realized this program, everybody here is motivated by fear. And fear is a good motivator short term. You know, stop smoking, you're going to die. But then long term, it doesn't stick. You really have to have a bigger bigger uh, motivation. In 1 John 4, 18, 
gives us that. I'm so glad I have this little notebook. 1 John 4, 18. Here it is on the screen. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. It's, it's bigger. It's a more powerful force than fear. So I, when I went into this program, I thought, man, I've got to help these people to begin to be motivated by love and not just fear. And I won't give particulars, but it was just rampant that everything had to do with fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So creating a culture of love and letting love compel us, letting love motivate us, that's the thing. And it's the same here for the enablers. So they're so afraid, little Johnny's going to die, i got to bail him out of jail, and fear's motivating it, You've got to help them to take a break and say, I need to do things out of love. Does that make sense? That's the goal. All right. So now you may have in your notebook, the enablers inventory. Do you guys have those notes? I pulled this out of divine intervention. It was in our um, divine intervention uh one of the, uh, which one was it? It was in Appendix A in Divine Intervention. And so I just made like an enabler's inventory for you to use. I use this in counseling and just try to help them see. I, I, I don't always just give it to them. Sometimes I ask it verbally and I score it. Um, but it's a way to ask questions. You see some examples there. I, get, I give you multiple warnings without following through and all that kind of thing. So you're giving them these and scoring it to kind of figure out how bad of an enabler they are. And I give you at the end a scale for that just to kind of uh, judge that. And so uh, you can use that in counseling if it helps you. Divine Intervention is a book I give family members uh, who are bad enablers because it, it's forcing them to trust God. Here, here's the thing, and we're going to close up in just a second. Enablers are afraid really of two extreme directions. If I kick them out of my house, and, and there's a proverb, I think it's 2610, that says, cast the scoffer out and strife ceases, right? So some people are afraid to do that, afraid to cast the scoffer out. Because if I do and I send them out and they die, I'm going to feel guilty that I didn't do enough. I cast them out too early and, I, and they got killed. The other extreme is I'm going to try to work with them and help them, but what if they die while I'm helping them? I, I have friends, you guys probably know, the Bucci's, um, struggled with that. They were trying to help their son. He ended up dying under their watch. So then it's like, well, we should have kicked him out or we should have done this. And I'm not saying they thought that, but some of you are familiar with their story. That's why I mentioned that. Uh, great friends, great people. So your counselees are struggling with either extreme. Kick them out or keep working with them. And I don't push them to make a choice. I don't say, well, you need to kick them out. Or, well, you need to keep working with them. I don't push them. I let God direct them. Because at the end of the day, they're going to feel guilty either direction. So they have to do it out of love and out of trust. And, and really, without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? So they need to be doing this out of faith in God and trusting in him, not wondering, you know, and doubting and afraid. If that's the motivation, then I'm going to counsel them that whatever they're doing, they need to be able to rest their head on the pillow at night to sleep, knowing they've done all. And that their loved one could die. That, that's the sad thing about this. It's urgent. You know, fentanyl's for real out there. I mean, it's killing people left and right. So we got to help them to be able to rest. And then you have in your notes, in the paper notes, uh, biblical examples of enabling. I go through Rebecca. And I don't know if there's fill in the blank. I hope there's not. Oh, watch it. Um, <laughs> I hope there's not fill in the blank so you just have the notes. But I think that Rebecca example, and you can read through that on your own time, is really helpful when you think about an enabler, Rebecca and Jacob and the deception that went on there. There's some really good lessons, and so I use that in counseling. 
And then the younger son in the parable of the prodigal son already referred to that. And we read verse 16. That's the one that, you know, no one gave him anything. That's out of that, that parable. And then you have also some more questions about heart motives, probing questions to try to get to the issue. And, uh, and then a closing thing. So pretty much you've, you've got it all, but go through that and utilize that in your counseling. And remember, these are hurting people, you know? At the end of the day, these are people who are hurting. I mean, it's their, their little child. I'm going to a graduation tomorrow, my 18 year old son. I mean, right now, He's okay, but could he start making bad choices and, and go the way? Yeah, he's not grounded in faith and you know, this could be it. So you, you never know. And I would hate that. I mean, I love this kid, you know, um, he's just wonderful. In some ways, I, I hope he'll still be my friend, you know, when he gets older, but you know, I wouldn't blame him if he didn't. Um, but you know, the, you love your kids. And so this is a, a big issue painful we have to be compassionate and gracious and merciful of folks but we have to give them the truth and we can't compromise on that and uh, and walk with them through it and god's called us to do that amen? amen let's pray and we'll wrap up this will be a quick prayer father thank you so much thank you that your word is true that you've called us to to uh, partner with you lord that you, you don't need us to partner with you as equals but you've called us to serve you and to, to share in these moments where we can walk with families and see victory and uh, do your will in a way that honors you. And so thank you for that. Help us, give us grace and, and help us to be merciful with family members as we minister to them when they're really struggling and in a dark time with their addicted loved ones. And Lord, may we point them to your truths and then Lord, we ask you by your spirit to move in the hearts of the addicted loved ones. To, to draw them out of darkness into your light, to be used by you for your kingdom purposes and your advancement in that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.